Welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show, the voice of the DSO industry. Kim Larson and Bill Newman talk to industry leaders about their challenges, successes, and the future of group dentistry. Visit groupdentistrynow.com for more DSO analysis, news, and events. Looking for a job or have a job to fill? Visit joindso.com. We hope you enjoy today's show. Hey, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Group Dentistry Now show. I'm Bill Newman, and we appreciate you listening in on your favorite listening platforms, whether it's Apple or Google or Spotify. We actually, you can listen to us on YouTube as well. And there's probably another seven or eight platforms that we're on. So anywhere you want to listen, you can listen to us. We've got three guests today. We're going to have a panel discussion on all things dental AI and how they re- how it relates to the dental industry and DSOs. So I'd like to introduce, first off, Dr. Warda Inham. She is the CEO and co-founder of Overjet AI. So Warda, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Mitch Olin. He is the executive chairman of DCA Dental Care Alliance. Thanks, Mitch, for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we have Dr. Seth Debris. He is the Senior Director of Clinical Advocacy for Heartland Dental. Welcome, Seth. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, Bill. So let me just run through some quick bios here, and then we'll get into the panel discussion. So let's start with Warda. She is, again, the CEO and also the co-founder of Overjet, which is a technology company that has pioneered the use of of dental artificial intelligence for payers and providers. Before founding Overjet, Warda was a product lead at QBio, a health technology company using AI to detect disease early. She completed her postdoctorate work at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab and has her PhD from MIT in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Overjet, and we'll talk about Overjet in more detail, was recently named one of the most innovative startups in the AI world that are redefining industries by CB Insights. So uh, again, Warda, thanks for being here. Um, Next up is Mitch. Mitch has over 27 years experience in the DSO space. He is currently the executive chairman at Dental Care Alliance. Before becoming the executive chairman, Mitch was the CEO at DCA for six years. And then prior to that, he had 18 years as the COO. He joined Dr. Steve Matzkin in 1994 to form Dental Care Alliance, which has grown into one of the oldest and the largest DSOs in the country with over 325 locations across 21 states. And prior to that, Uh, Mitch actually was on the manufacturing side uh, in the orthodontic industry uh, with Ormco. So that's that's something I didn't know, Mitch. And we have Dr. Seth Gabri. Dr. Seth Gabri is the Senior Director of Clinical Advocacy for Heartland Dental. As the Clinical Advocacy Director, he has a daily focus on supporting doctors and their teams, primarily around strategic planning, AI, and machine learning. Prior to his time with Heartland Dental, Dr. Gabri started and owned multiple multidisciplinary dental practices. Seth's values are deeply rooted in faith, family, and community. He is a key opinion leader and industry expert with 20 plus years of experience with expertise in strategy, communication, emerging technology, leading change, and organizational development. He has also served on the editorial advisory board of Dental Town Magazine since 2009. Big resumes everybody has. So again, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I know that was, uh, those are some really uh, some well-credentialed individuals in the DSO space and also the dental AI industry. Um, But it's important for everybody to get to know the team. So let's get into the panel discussion here. Um, We're going to start off with Warda. Can you set this stage a little bit? Let's talk about dental AI and then its impact in the DSO space. And and Warda and I were talking a little bit off uh, before we started the record about, you know, just some of the impressions that the industry has and people have. But Warda, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you, Bill. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be talking about dental artificial intelligence here. uh, And the first question of what is dental artificial intelligence? Uh, It's software that encodes dentist level understanding of disease identification and progression into models. And these models are precise, bias-free and scalable. 
So these models interpret dental data similar to, to a dentist, but much faster. So for example, you can process all the data in a practice in minutes, identifying bone loss, caries, impactions, calculus on every tooth for every patient in a practice. So this would have taken a dentist months to do, and that's uh, and that enables amazing abilities for DSOs to support their affiliated practices and provide them abilities that you've not had before in, in processing data and analyzing data, similar to dentists, uh, but much faster, uh, and being able to analyze vast amounts of data very, very quickly. Let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the DSO space. So we can, you know, Ward, I'd like to get your impressions, and then I'd love to talk to both Seth, Seth and, and Mitch a little bit about what they're seeing and you know, the impact early on with, with dental AI. The great thing about DSOs is that they have been always at the forefront of adopting technology, and that has changed dentistry as well. Uh, you know, dentistry was known to be uh, an industry which was uh, slower to adopt technology. Uh, but when it comes to DSOs, uh, there has been this uh, adoption of technology at a level that we have not seen before uh, in order to support their affiliated practices to, to perform better as well as uh, in order to uh, uh, provide better care to the patients as well. So th this is one of the technologies that we see that DSOs are uh, adopting in order to support their practices. And here we, we're seeing four trends that we also mentioned in the article. And number one is practice analysis and affiliations. So that means uh, being able to affiliate practices uh, while looking at uh, all the practice data in a way that has not been possible before. Basically, previously we were looking at only the business data. Now you have the ability to look at the clinical data as well. Second is looking at uh, all the chart reviews. So not only are you utilizing a few uh, number of charts from a particular patient or a provider, now you have this ability to look at every chart of every patient uh, and every radiograph that, that has been taken and being able to identify trends uh, that might be helpful. Uh, third, looking at uh, performance uh, and performance enhancement, uh, wh whether it is uh, uh, the diagnosis and, and how that has become more evidence-based, but also having tools provided to uh, the, the practices for better visualizations uh, so that you can actually communicate better with the patients as well. And lastly, uh, which is an interesting topic that we didn't uh, look at early on, which is specialty referrals. So giving the ability to general uh, dentists to not only uh, uh, look at treatments and procedures that might have been, they might have uh, done in the past, but also look at more specialty procedures, whether they want to do it in-house or refer it to uh, outside uh, as well, and giving that the ability, whether it's ortho or imperio. Uh, and, and that is some of the things that are happening now in the future. We're excited about is being able to screen for medical conditions as well automatically. So these are some of the things that we're excited about. We're seeing uh, some of the DSOs uh, look into as well. Uh, and I'll let the others uh, add if, uh, if they have something to add there. Dr. Enum, I, I believe that you and Dr. Gibri and, and Mitch Olin recently co-wrote an article in Compendium with a number of DSO, other DSO leaders. You really talk about the impact. So I'd love to kind of talk, maybe Seth, you can talk a little bit about that and um, what you wrote in the article. And, and I'd love to hear, you know, what you're seeing right now and, and how you're using dental AI. Well, I mean, I think I uh, appreciate the question and, and the time. I think it's, um, I think it's an important to remember that what we do at, especially at Heartland as a DSO, and our goal is to be a world-class company and the leader in dentistry is that we wake up every day trying to figure out how we can support doctors and their teams as they deliver high quality dental care to their communities. And so looking at technology, you have to look at it with, a, with an open mind on how does this help doctors and their teams help their patients to achieve a higher level of clinical care and consistency. And so I think looking at the potential of what AI can bring, as Warder was talking, the ability to analyze and to really dive into details that as a doctor is really hard to stay focused on all those things. I need to, as a doctor, I need to be focused on that patient in front of me and making sure they have the care and that they need and the best thing that I can do. And so how can we support them utilizing technology to do that better? And I think she, she hit on so many wonderful points 
um, even the last point you were talking about specialty referrals, I just, I think of ortho cases and how in my career as a practitioner, how the more cases I saw, then the more I learned, okay, in this case, we need to do some interceptive ortho, or I need to refer this to an orthodontist. I'm not in there. My, my skill set isn't comfortable handling it as well as an orthodontist. And so being able to evaluate cases on an early basis and almost red light, yellow light, green light, um, so to speak on, on what the, the, difficulty of those cases are and say, okay, this case is a great case for aligners, fairly straightforward. There's not a a ton of movement. This case is a more complex case and having AI support kind of when you refer and when you're, you don't, depending on your, your practice level and where you're at as a, as a clinician, I think is so important. So that's just one example of, of numerous ones where the technology has the potential to help from a business tool case, but also from a clinical use case. Now, I think as a dentist, you, you start freaking out a little bit in that it's, oh, big brother is going to watch. And I think it's trying to flip that mindset and say, okay, how can we support doctors make the best decisions for their patients in a, in a unbiased way as Warner was talking about? And that's a great point about Big Brother, Seth. I'd love to maybe talk to you about that in a little bit more detail. Um, but uh, Mitch, why don't you t- talk a little bit about, um, you know, the thoughts on, on artificial intelligence and, and how the DCA is using it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, it's, um, it's, it's something that can be used in so many different ways. I mean, from a uh, business development standpoint, from a clinical um, uh, management, uh, mentoring, auditing standpoint, from an operational data standpoint, um, you know, we, we really, um, you know, from a, from a business development standpoint, you know, every DSO, you know, has its own approach to assess the risk and value and, and potential for each practice affiliate. But uh, one common objective is to understand prior treatment norms, trends, outliers, so on and so forth. Um, you know, traditionally, during a, uh, a prospective affiliation, uh, you know, most DSOs take a small sample of patient charts to understand the existing standard of care and, uh, and the attributes of, of the patient population. Uh, what dental AI uh, really provides is it unlocks the ability uh, to complete this review in detail for every patient of the practice. Uh, this means that every radiograph and, and actually uh, you know, every chart note can be analyzed uh, and provides a detailed, uh, detailed database to support clinical and business decisions on an affiliation. Do we move forward? How do we move forward? Um, so that you, you're, you're finding uh, affiliates that blend ba- basically into your organization a lot smoother, um, a lot cleaner. Uh, philosophically, they're on, they're, they're in the same ballpark. Culturally, you know, they're, they're, they're in the same ballpark, and, uh, and, and it makes for a much better uh, win-win for, uh, for the affiliate as well as the uh, DSO. Um, you know, there's other areas that uh, you know, I, I mentioned in terms of, um, you know, clinical, uh, you know, it really our, our clinical uh, uh, affiliated clinical directors are very excited about the ability to use this tool for, uh, for audits, for training, for mentoring. Uh, they currently, we currently have full-time auditors. And uh, so when you talk about Big Brother watching, uh, Big Brother in, in most DSOs is, is already watching to some degree, but they're taking a very limited sample. And what, uh, what uh, with artificial intelligence, what that provides us with is the ability to take a much broader sample uh, of uh, actually the entire uh, database of, uh, of patients that a, a doctor is working on and, and show them what the, how they're comparing against you know, hundreds of thousands of other patients and doctors and, uh, and, and, and cases out there to see you know, the, where, where they might be uh, an outlier, where they're trending, uh, how they stack up. Uh, it's a tremendous learning tool. And something that uh, you know, you know, doctors shouldn't be um, afraid of. They shouldn't be intimidated by. They should embrace as a as a phenomenal learning tool. You know, and, and from an operational standpoint, um, you know, it really it it helps us from a uh, the ability to uh, to work with our our teams to help better support the doctors uh, with integration for new affiliations, with uh, with support uh, with the existing docs on what they want to try to accomplish when uh, when they go through with their clinical directors, um, and and how we can better support them to uh, to accomplish their goals. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that, and that was one of my points, I guess, with, with Seth is, you know, the, the big brother aspect, or at least that perception, but Mitch, you touched on it. It, it, it shouldn't be necessarily looked at it that way. It could be looked at it really as an opportunity to, um, you know, as a, as a training tool, a mentorship tool to 
you know, if, if somebody, a uh, clinician, it maybe is, is struggling, that uh, this can be used to kind of uh, really help engage them and, and find out where the, they, they're struggling and, and help them out. That, that, that's that's right. Not, you know, and it, it could also help them too. You know, when when they see what the, what the, they might be diagnosing quite a bit, but they're getting you know they're not getting the type of uh, treatment acceptance that their their colleagues are getting because they don't have the same communication skills. And so what um, you know what what the dental AI also helps with is a presentation tool for the doctors to use when uh, when presenting to the patients and uh, to give them a greater confidence with the with the diagnosis, give the patients a greater confidence with the diagnosis and the doctors uh, a, a much broader database to share with the patients as to how, what's going on in the patient's mouth as compared to these 10,000, 100,000, 200,000 other cases that have been uh, that have been uh, diagnosed in the system. Great points. Warda, I mean, this is sort of really talking about, you know, some, some key opportunities within AI, right? So there, there's a lot of different ways it can be used. Uh, what are you finding the majority when, when, a, when a DSO or an emerging group decides they want to get involved with AI and work with Overjet? Where do they, is there, is there a first step? Is there an area of focus right away? I mean, what are you seeing? So uh, for us, uh, depending on the size of the practice or, or the DSO, so if it's, uh, you know, 50 and above, we see them ad- adopting the chart review first. If it's 50 or below, we see them adopting the practice tools uh, first. So it uh, depends on what their objectives are and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, as uh, Mitch mentioned, you know, if you, ha- if you have a large practice, being able to ensure quality compliance across the uh, practice uh, is hard. That means you have significant amount of people looking at uh, uh, the data and trying to ensure that the right care is getting delivered, as well as uh, supporting the dentists uh, in any other way that they might be uh, might need as well. So not only uh, is it just to look at, you know, things that might be going wrong, but actually what we find is the other way around. Now you can actually finally see what in your practice is actually going right and being able to learn from the, the, the learnings. And a lot of the dentists are very surprised when we tell them that you know, on these metrics, you're actually doing so much better than 80% of the other practices. And for them, they've never uh, seen that before compared against other practices as well. And it's a way for them to not only have uh, areas of improvement, but also uh, know where they're really shining as well and, and have that kind of uh, complete comprehensive view of their performances as well as uh, the the entire uh, uh, all the pra- practices uh, that are in the network as well. So f- uh, from our, our point of view, when we look at a chart review, not only are we looking at uh, what has been completed, but also what has been treatment planned uh, and uh, w- w- what has actually been treated. And that way we can highlight things that are uh, w- not being uh, done or should be looked into. And, uh, and those things uh, are something that, you know, uh, at, at the managerial level, you can look at all your practices and help identify uh, and, and drill down on what thing areas of improvement that need to be there and help uh, support the uh, the dentist as well. Uh, and um, on the other side, on the practice level, uh, that is more to what Mitch mentioned regarding communication. So better patient experience, better communication with the patient. So the patients are more informed to make the right decision for themselves uh, by looking at uh, better visualizations. So when you know a dentist uh, uh, points at a, a gray and white or black image, uh, the patients don't see a lot. You know, apart from say them recognizing a tooth, there's not a lot that they, they can recognize in that image. And on top of that, if you add periodontal disease and carious lesions and calculus, that's that's a lot of information that is being provided to the patient. And having uh, the presentation layer or the the output visualizations really help the dentist to point to the um, uh, to that X-ray and and uh, and especially to those visualizations and and that that brings uh, the condition to life for the patient and better make them better understand. So those are the two areas that we're seeing, depending on the size of the practice or what's being adopted uh, first. But in both cases, uh, uh, you know, it, it is going from one to the other. And uh, the more that dentists uh, utilize the technology, the more they see uh, how, how much of a 
um, uh, how useful it is. Uh, and I think all the fears, et cetera, that, uh, that they might have go away very quickly. So a lot of, uh, for us, it is about showing uh, the technology. And I think that's what helps people understand it. And then when they utilize it in their practices, I think we've not had a single practice that's not been shocked at their numbers, uh, the good and the bad, and being able to say, okay, how can uh, I do better? And how, how can I take pride in what I'm doing really good as well? Thanks, Ward. Dr. Gibri, I'd love to get a little uh, perspective um, clinically. Maybe talk a little bit about you know Heartland and how you started things off with dental AI, and 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 maybe how you're using it right now. As a clinician, what excites me is the stuff that Ward and Mitch were just talking about. Like, how can I help my patient receive the care that I believe that they need? Because I'm not diagnosing this if I don't think it's in their best interest to get it done. And so having a third party support that basically, I don't know, somewhat you have an independent variable that's there to help communicate to the patient and help them understand it at a higher level. It's funny how many times as, as a doctor, we tend to want to draw pictures and over explain. And we know so much about dentistry. And I think sometimes we get so excited to share it and we overwhelm people. And so I think having that access to almost like a third party validation and, and to be able to help people make the best decision for their health care is so important. And even taking it a step further before I dive into the Heartland question, because um, I'll make sure I get that for you even taking it a step further, having the ability to compare, say I'm 46 years old, my 46 year old mouth with the medicines I'm on to other people that fit my same demographics of healthcare. And so what's the best decision for the long-term health of my mouth? Is it going down a preventive nature based on what's seen? Is it, is it maybe some interceptive stuff early, early that there's actually the ability to take so much information and dial it down into predictable care is what is super exciting for me. And the other thing is reducing liability. Uh, we were talking about chart audits earlier. And, and I think part of it too is helping the doctor say, okay, we don't have a medical history update for this, for this patient and being able to make sure that stuff is done or, or thinking about how much over the years, how much time my team is spent on chart preps in the morning for our morning huddles and saying, well, this patient has this, they don't have a future hygiene appointment for their family member. All that stuff can be automated, even to say how much having AI be able to review x-rays and say, well, there was actually a class two lesion on number 14 that we didn't really talk about last time. So being able to analyze what edentulous spaces are there and is it potential for implants based on their bone levels, based on their medical history, is it the proportion of class two and class three carious lesions that ha haven't been treated that need to be treated. What's the periodontal health and predictability of the population? Um, what percentage of, of teeth are posterior teeth contain amalgam that are huge? And so how old are those? Is that something we need to really look at to make sure these teeth aren't starting to crack and split, especially because people are more stressed during COVID times? I, I, like, I get excited when I, I think about the ability of this in the the diagnostic patient communication, patient treatment realm um, makes me super excited. Within Heartland, I'll go back to what I even said before, is we wake up every day figuring out how we can better support doctors and their teams to help them deliver care to their patients. And so that, that clinical relationship is so important that that lies at the local level between the doctor and the patient. And that's why we're a dental support organization. We're supporting them however we can for the non-clinical stuff. And part of AI that's exciting is it can help them as they desire, they wanna use it to be able to clinically help their patients at a higher level. And so with us, with adoption, yes, there's, we talk about AI and, and a lot of people think about certain specifics, but AI covers a wide, wide spectrum of, of business tools, clinical tool, tools, and, and there's some really exciting things coming down the road that I think will help those even better being developed by companies like um, Overjet and, and others in, in the marketplace currently. Um, so I think it's a matter of adopting, but it's, a, it's adopting it in a strategic manner that makes sense for the, the practices that we're supporting. So it's evaluating what works in the workflow because part of adoption of something is it's easier when I own a practice or two, it's easier for me to adopt that into my philosophy when I believe in it and I can get my team on board with it when you talk about change management, 
in a company that supports over 1100 practices, we, we have to really, really think deeply on how that affects practice flow and patient flow and in my ability in one practice to adapt. And yeah, if I make a mistake here and it's, and it's not a big deal, but it could be a big deal. So we want to make sure that as we roll out things, we're rolling it out in the most strategic and man, in strategic manner that makes the most sense um, in the workflow for our, our supported clinicians. So it's, it sounds like you're uh, really looking at a significant amount of data and insights. Uh, you know, I'd like to pose this to Mitch, you know, whether it's existing practices or possibly from a business development perspective, are you using dental AI at all to kind of look at some of these potential practices to acquire? Are you able to, to do a practice analysis that way? We, we have not used it to that extent yet, but we have every intention to do that. It's, it's something that, um, you know, that we've got to first get our team comfortable with. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the beta stages of, uh, of trying this out and, uh, and you know, everything that looks very positive thus far. Uh, the, once we, right now, it's, it's within our, our, what we call our, um, our innovation committees uh, world, which uh, is a combination of our uh, IT team and our clinical team and our operations team and how they roll this out, where they're going to, where they're going to test it, how they're going to test it. And, uh, but ultimately uh, we see it very much a, a tool for the business development team uh, to, uh, to, to better assess a, a, a prospective candidate to, uh, to join the, the organization. And if they're the good, if they're a good fit or not. Warda, this is for you. So, uh, you know, as, as Mitch talked about is, you know, getting clinicians comfortable with this and other team members comfortable with AI. What is it Overjet's doing really to kind of onboard and, and help educate? Because I, I, I'm, I'm curious, is there a big learning curve? What, what does that look like? So the way we see it is uh, not only is the technology being developed by clinicians. So if you think about it, where does the data come in from, uh, which we use to train our models? It actually comes from dentists. So dentists are actually creating these models. Uh, uh, we're just architecting them. Uh, and then second is actually uh, utilizing that uh, in the practice as well. So we, uh, the clinicians on the team on board, uh, the clinicians uh, uh, in the practices themselves as well, uh, and uh, uh, such that, that they uh, feel comfortable in utilizing the technology as well as uh, their staff as well, which might be hygienists and office managers, et cetera. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, making them feel uh, comfortable, a lot of it is the outputs, being able to see first time they notice something that they uh, uh, missed or have had ignored uh, and it, it's brought to them or, you know, something is brought in, uh, in, um, or, uh, in front of them uh, and, and that makes them look a little deeper. Th those are the times when we get an email back saying, oh, wow, like I didn't imagine it to work this way. So I think it's, uh, you know, uh, so far for us, we've been very lucky that the, the dentists, the practices we've worked with have been uh, excited to use the technology uh, as well as uh, see the potential of it uh, uh, in terms of better patient experience, better patient care, uh, and want to utilize it in this way. And as uh, both Mitch and uh, uh, Seth mentioned, you know, being able to, uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to be done right now. It isn't, you know, a full, uh, fully completed technology that is, uh, you know, similar to say uh, something that has existed for like 20 or 30 years. This is a new technology. And with any new technology, there's a lot of potential, but there's also uh, uh, understanding of risk, et cetera, that you, you need to look at. So, uh, you know, the good thing is DSOs have teams to evaluate uh, both aspects, uh, but also especially clinicians are, you know, for, for us, uh, the biggest champions have always been clinicians uh, because once they see it for them, it's like, okay, I totally get it. Uh, and, uh, and after that, it is about uh, seeing what, you know, in your practice, what works, how, how would you roll it out? And it varies uh, DSO to DSO and even uh, smaller uh, groups as well. Uh, and we work with the, the groups, making sure that they're comfortable with uh, uh, the rollout, they're comfortable with the adoptions uh, as well, but also making sure that uh, all the protocols are being followed in such a way that the uh, patient uh, care and experience is, is being kept in, in mind and making sure that that's at, at the best quality ever. 
I'd like to ask Seth this question, and maybe we can bring Mitch in a little bit and get some perspective on how chart auditing is typically being done today uh, at Heartland and then at DCA, and then Warda can maybe talk a little bit about what, how she sees um, AI really changing that. But Seth, if you wanna start. I mean, in short, I would say that um, there's a checklist that uh, you would go through as you look through a chart to make sure it has um, the right signatures, right medical histories are reviewed. Um, do they have an FMX or do they have um, some sort of full radiographic experience in there? Has a patient been seen for a comprehensive review? So it's, it's, it's pretty random, truthfully. And I think that's one of the things that's that's hard to do because you're you're pulling and they they're time consuming. I think Mitch said when he was talking earlier they have a full time team that does that um, because of just some of the detail. Usually it's a, an, an administrator and a, a doctor will look through some of those items too. Is there period charting? Are the radiographs up to date? What are the past diagnosis um, treatment plans? Does something need to be followed up on? And so it's about trying to improve the standard of care, but making sure also that you're doing the right thing from a liability standpoint. So I would say there's a process to that. Um, that's a, a continual ongoing process that's managed. Um, but I think the the future ability to automate that brings excitement. And I think that's, that's one of the key things that we have to think about in developing technologies is as we look about new things out there. And this is emerging technology. And I mean, I think that's one thing Warda was just trying to trying to share is that these are things that are being developed and are growing. So it's exciting. Like to me, it's exciting because the potential that I see to automate processes that are manual currently allows us to focus at a higher level on our patients. So how do we, how do we utilize AI with like chart reviews or chart audits to make a process, which is a, which is a manual process currently, and it's very time consuming and not truly comprehensive. How do we automate that into something that's less time consuming and gives us greater insight into a liability of a practice or, or help a, a clinician to reduce their liability and make sure make sure the systems are where they need to be. And then on the other side of that, from an AI standpoint, being able to help with business tools and, and making sure that the business team can, can work in a more efficient manner related to the patient. So there's a lot of excitement in the development of it, and there's a ton of potential and I think within the dental space, especially, it's kind of floors open for, I think, players to come in and try to figure out solutions to problems that we've just been addressing at the office level for years and years and years. And even as, as DSOs working toward providing systems to help those be as efficient as possible, if that makes sense. Mitch, do you have anything to add as far as uh, the chart audits at uh, DCA and what, what you're currently doing? Yeah, I mean, we, our process is very similar. It sounds like I mean, we've got uh, we've got a committed a uh, couple of committed um, uh, docs that are uh, you know former clinicians with us that have uh, retired from the chair. Um, also have uh, clinical directors in the field that do chart audits. Uh, more more importantly, they they look closely the you know with the the, the newer docs, uh, the younger docs. Uh, it's an opportunity to help counsel and coach them, and mentor them. Um, the, we have a, um, uh, a you know a system that uh, every doctor has to you know have X number of audit or charts audited per quarter, uh, so that they are you know. To, but you know, but you know, if that's ten or a dozen or twenty charts, it's nothing like what we can accomplish with with AI. So, you know, with, with so many doctors to, to audit, I mean, we have uh, over 750 affiliated doctors. I mean, Heartland has got probably three times that number. It's tough to get out there and, and, and audit more than a dozen, you know, 15, 20 charts per quarter per doctor, because they are time consuming to make sure that that's being done right. So, I mean, that's the exciting aspect for from us is the, uh, of, of what AI can bring to that process and make it a lot more efficient, uh, make it a lot more comprehensive, make it a lot more educational. Thanks, Mitch. Warda, do you have any input? And in, um, you talk really about how AI can reinvent chart audits. You know, where where do you see AI right now? Are we like in the second inning? I mean, what, what what's what's the future look like there? Yeah. So what we did was when we looked at started on a chart auditor chart review, we basically got our best dentist and we said, here is a practice. You know, look at the charts and let us know. You know, where where do you see any issues? They, they, they you know, there were it was a big uh, DSO. They started, they picked the dentist. They started looking at their charts, five or six charts in. They said, oh, I think there's some issue with uh, with what, what's happening here. 
Uh, we took the uh, dentist data, we processed the entire data set, every patient's record, every uh, appointment, every uh, note that they had taken. And we actually found that it was actually st not statistically um, uh, significant what, what they had found. So the, the fact that looking at five or 10 charts does not tell you, uh, you know, it might say, yeah, they, there were a few things here and there, but it it isn't statistically significant to actually say that, uh, you know, uh, it needs more review even. Uh, and that is, you know, the challenge here, which is it's just not humanly possible to review every uh, chart uh, and be able to uh, even do it at a, st a statistically significant level by being able to see, okay, how many procedures have they done, etc. And, and that's where I think by being able to automatically review it now, uh, you not only give the benefit of the doubt uh, and, uh, and have statistically significant results here, uh, but also, uh, you know, nobody's perfect. Everybody, you know, there's something, uh, a few things that might be going wrong, et cetera. You're able to uh, see whether that is, uh, the person is an outlier or, or they might just be, there might be a few charts that X things might be off. So I think there is an opportunity here to make this process more quantitative, make it more uh, accurate, such that uh, you can actually rely on the results of these uh, reviews uh, to, to a point uh, to make a, a decision whether it is, that a particular provider needs a C course that they should be taking, or uh, uh, whether it is that they're doing such a great job that they should be um, mentoring some of the other younger dentists in the practices, or whatever the decision might be, but being able to collect en enough information that you can actually make a very good decision uh, is, is what we feel uh, the use of this technology is, as well as completely changes how we look at chart reviews rather than just it being a tick mark or making sure that compliance is happening, but really a tool to ensure uh, that uh, the dentists are being supported in such a way that they are not, they're getting feedback, they're improving, they're uh, achieving the goals that they want to achieve uh, and uh, DSOs are supporting them in doing so. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hannum. So I, I'm going to, as we start to wrap this up a little bit, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Gibri, uh, just from a perspective, we'll get a little, maybe a, a futuristic viewpoint here. So as a clinician, wh wh what would you, where would you like to see AI go? Uh, and then we can kind of ask Mitch as uh, somebody who was in a, a COO for, for a, quite a while and then a CEO, um, you know, where, where you think, it, you know, this really AI can excel in, in the DSO space, but, but Seth, I'll let you start. Wow, I, I think where would I like to see it go is is, is well, where do you think it think it will go? <laughs> Maybe that's. Um, I I think I get excited when I've seen what I've seen as potential. I think that's one of the one of the cool things that I get to do on a daily basis is have conversations with company like like Warders and others that that exist out there both in the clinical realm and in the business realm of the AI space, and I get to see what, what they're trying to develop in the problems that they're trying to solve for, in the business use cases they're trying to make. And those things are exciting. Like if they can figure out the computer science side of the data programming and the machine learning, that the capabilities that exist to that will open up the door to allow us as clinicians, like Warder was talking about, even with chart reviews, to have a true vision of saying, okay, this is what's going on. How can we help or how can how can we support this doctor or this team at a higher level? And I think that's what excites me, both from, from, a, from a dental support organization side, but also from a clinical advocate side, because that's what I do is say, okay, how can we help doctors and their teams? And so I think it's super exciting, one, from a business tool use to help, I mean, business team members that answer the phone that are the first really contact, human contact that a patient might have with an office, their jobs are hard. And dentistry is a hard, hard thing to do day in and day out. And so I think anything that that can be created that helps streamline the ability to care for their patients is what excites me. So from a clinic, from a clinical standpoint, having, we talked about it earlier, having the ability to have third-party validation for a diagnosis or, or even have something that if I just came out of doing 
a, a crown prep and two fillings on a patient that could barely open and won't let won't lean back and gags every time you you put a drill in their mouth. It's a hard situation. And then I go in to do a hygiene check and on a new patient, I've got to be on my best. And I think AI helps give a second set of eyes or has the potential to give a second set of eyes of looking at, at that patient as a unique experience, that that patient can get the best of you even when you're tired and you're worn down and, and, and it gives you insights into highlighting things that maybe, we're not, again, Warda said we're not, none of us are perfect. And that's, I think, a, a great thing to remember. And then on the flip side of that, I get excited when I think about the mentorship possibilities that AI brings to the table is we are really big as a DSO on our mentor network and our ability to mentor doctors in, in our, our clinical network. And I think the ability to help each other do better and, and be the best clinicians that we desire to be is super exciting. There's, there's so many possibilities on that side of things. And I could go on for ages and ages and ages about this. And so I think I will shut up now, but I appreciate the question. Uh, that's, that's great input uh, from a clinician and then also from a clinical management standpoint. So, so we appreciate that. Uh, Mitch, from an from a operations standpoint, can you give us a little feedback on you know, what, where you would like to see things headed? We've been talking about AI as it, as it applies to uh, radiographs and uh, and 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 patient um, uh, patient data in the uh, you know in the practice. Uh, there's also AI that's being developed that is is being applied towards um, you know call centers, uh, telephone, uh, ans- uh, you know answering the phones. Um, those are really uh, they they support the operations to make for a more efficient uh, you know process uh, for uh, for patient management, a better patient experience. Um, you know the AI that we're talking about it supports compliance. Uh, you know the the you know from a from a, um, uh, a DSO's perspective, one of the things that you want to make sure that you have is a good compliance program. And you know if you if you get uh, uh, rogue uh, operators, uh, you you know the, they can they can tarnish the the reputation of the entire organization. Um, so you want to you want to make sure that you have a good compliance program, and, and AI really helps with that. And from a uh, from looking at it from a CEO standpoint, you know, having something that uh, that allows us to use that as a tool to continue our, to um, uh, polish our reputation and uh, our systems uh, is is a tremendous uh, is a tremendous tool to have. Um, we talked about the the ability for it to support affiliations, you know, affiliation assessment, affiliation integration. Uh, those are all uh, you know very powerful. Tools for artificial intelligence to help you know in the way that they can they can bring data to the table that uh, that uh, that currently is very tough to get to, um, and the the and finally uh, you know I think that you know well not finally but the, my my last thought on it right now is uh, you know it supports training uh, which you know again from a DSO's perspective. You know, the, the more you train your people, the, the better the, they become, the, the more committed they are to the organization, the more they feel like you're putting you're investing in them, uh, the better the outcomes are from, uh, you know, from, from those uh, employees. And I'm not talking just about, you know, clinicians being trained by clinicians. I'm talking about the, uh, the non-clinicians being trained as well. And AI really helps in that uh, process. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, Warda, I'll let, you, I'll let you finish this off. So uh, as far as you know, you're working with a number of DSOs on the application of dental AI, um, and as, as you look across the industry, merging groups, larger DSOs like, like Heartland and DCA, uh, where else do you see the technology leading? Great question. I think, uh, you know, and I, I'll address your, uh, I think I missed a little piece of your last question, which is where is AI right now? And where, and then I'll address where is it le- uh, leading us uh, as well. And here, the, the great thing is uh, at this time, when it comes to clinical diagnosis or uh, clinician decision support tools, the AI models are at a point that are either exceeding uh, or meeting dentist level accuracy in determining uh, pathologies on x-rays and determining treatment planning uh, as well. Uh, the, uh, the question here is how it gets adopted. That's where, you know, uh, doing it in, in such a fashion that is uh, uh, not disruptive to the practices as well as the patient themselves uh, and supports the dentist in, in doing so. Uh, we, we're all already working uh, with some of the largest pairs. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, utilization review or uh, claims review is now going through AI in determining whether claims should be paid out or not based on 
medical necessity. So that that, that is already happening in the dental industry. Uh, and that was, uh, we went into production last year. So uh, uh, that's something that, you know, payers have adopted very, very quickly uh, in order to ensure efficiencies in their uh, operations, as well as make sure that accurate decisions are made, which providers were not uh, quite happy with in, uh, previously. And now we're seeing uh, uh, improvement in, in appeals as well as making sure that the right decisions are being made when it comes to determining whether a claim will be paid out or not. So there's already AI being utilized in the dental uh, industry and a lot of the things that we mentioned uh, that are helping uh, uh, DSOs as well as practices uh, uh, do better. Uh, for, uh, but what we're very excited about and we're uh, laying the groundwork for is uh, you know, also uh, improving that uh, uh, patient experience even further. And there, uh, you know, especially making decisions on claims while the patient is in the chair. So predetermination or pre-authorization of claims while the patient is in the chair. Uh, and that way uh, they, they know, uh, you know, there's no financial uncertainty. Uh, they're not we waiting weeks for determining whether the claim will be paid out or not. Uh, and and they, they, they are able to make that decision while in the chair, whether they would like the treatment, especially if the insurance companies will pay for that as well. So that's something that we believe uh, that DSOs as well as the insurance companies have a major role to play in, in order to ensure the right care for the patient, uh, as well as it's a win for the DSO as well with better um, revenue cycle management and, and for the insurance companies uh, in, in a way that they, they can see that the right treatments are being performed too. So there are, you know, the, this technology we believe is a win-win, uh, which usually doesn't happen for the payer, provider, and the patient. And that's why it's being adopted this quickly uh, across the ecosystem and why there's so much excitement about it uh, and no pushback really from one side uh, uh, strongly against it, which will really help this technology uh, even uh, achieve a lot. Uh, and the second thing that we're very excited about is medical dental integration. We started work, research work with Harvard School of Dental Medicine uh, uh, and their initiative of oral and overall health and other uh, groups where we're working on how do you uh, screen for medical conditions in the dental practice? How do you ensure that uh, the risk is being taken care of? You're looking at outcomes and you're able to measure progression of disease and outcomes to improve the care while you're not just looking at oral health you're utilizing oral health data and the practice to really improve the overall health of the patient as well. So those are things that we're very excited about and where we feel that this technology is going to have a huge impact, not only uh, in uh, improving care for the patients uh, uh, when it comes to oral health, but in, uh, in overall health as well. Thank you, Warda. Great way to finish things off. I really would like to thank the, the panelists for being here today and really clearing some things up regarding dental AI, talking a little bit about how they're using it currently in their DSOs and then what the future holds for DSOs using dental AI, the industry, the providers and the patients as well. So just a quick shout out. Thank you, Dr. Seth Gibry of Heartland Dental. Thank you to Mitch Olin of Dental Care Alliance and thank you to Dr. Warda Inam of Overjet. We really appreciate your input today on the Group Dentistry Now show. Uh, and until next time, I'm Bill Newman. We appreciate you listening in. And I'll have links to Heartland, Dental Care Alliance, and of course, Overjet in the show notes. Uh, thanks again for listening. Until next time. The Group Dentistry Now show has listeners across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. If you like our show, subscribe today and please tell your colleagues about us.